Father, we thank you for your word today. We ask in Jesus' name that uh, you communicate it to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, it's able to get right into the heart and deal with the nitty-gritty. Father, it can divide between spiritual things and things of the soul, and it can reveal, Father, the, the state of our hearts, where we're at. And Father, we need that word searching us. Lord, it's a light in darkness, searching us, Father, and revealing our ways to, a, to you or to us, Lord. Although you forgive us and although you love us, Lord God, uh, yet, Father, you don't leave us the way we are. You love us too much for that. And so, Father, you bring us into something new, something greater, something that's going to last for eternity. Father, our eyes haven't comprehended it. Our, we haven't understood the fullness of that which you've prepared for us. But as we get into your word, Lord, as we look into that covenant that you have formed with us through Jesus, uh, Father, we find, we find glimpses of that eternal purpose, Lord God. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Well, you might have, might have wondered why uh, in the last, uh, last thing I've been talking a lot more about church. Uh, I've had quite a few people in recent times talk to me about, well, what's God called me to do? And, you know, I've got, I know I've got this call in my life. I know I've got gifts and that. But how do I sort of get the whole thing moving? Well, a uh, little encouragement to you is you can't. If you're trying to do it by yourself, uh, it's just not going to happen. In fact, uh, you know, you can actually pervert the gift that God's given you. Uh, God, through the Holy Spirit, joins us together. What are the gifts for? Theologians out there, 1 Corinthians 12, who are the gifts given for? For you? No, they're given for others, aren't they? For that all might prosper, that the body might be built up in itself in love. And, you know, we in Australia here have, uh, and in our Western world, the church over the, the uh, centuries has come to a, a place that's got nothing to do with what God originally intended. Uh, I've entitled this, uh, this sermon Authentic Christianity, and then in the same sentence put uh, CFC's vision. That might sound a little bit arrogant, but... Uh, have I got this on wrong? Uh, Authentic Christianity is, all it's, uh, is what it's all about. You know, I, as a young lad, grew up in a denominational church, which uh, I, I won't mention, although it's not a secret. And uh, it was just, you came to church week after week, and it was the same stuff. Nothing much happened. Nothing was really applied. You just went, came, and you attend this ritual, and you went through the motions, and that was it. And I think by the age of about three, I was getting tired of it. And by the age of 12, I refused to go anymore. Um, it just didn't minister. And uh, when I got born again, you know, there was something that was keeping me from being born again almost, or keeping me from making that final decision, was that, will, am I willing to go back into that old thing? And mercifully, God didn't want me back in that old thing. Because God wants to build his church, Jesus is building his church in a different way than what we see traditionally in our Western culture. Amen? It's the church is likened to a body with all parts functioning. It's referred to as a house, which we'll be looking at uh, a little bit more today. Uh, God's used many metaphors in the Bible to describe what the church is. And it's something that captures my heart. You know, I, I, I like to know what God is building and because and, if you see the plan, you can probably figure out your part in it. Amen? A lot of people just wander around, you know, oblivious to the plan, but trying to, uh, trying to fulfill their ministry. But, you know, we're all called to build in some way. So it's important that we see the plan that, uh, and the plan is, is laid down fairly clearly here. Not so clearly that it, you, you could sort of give it just a casual sort of glance and get it. Uh, the things of God are not like that. They are more deep. They take a little bit of digging into in order to discover. And God set it up that way. Well, let's talk about church and, and home groups. The natural thing to do at church 
is seek out and find a small group of people to talk to before and after the, the main body of the service. Uh, you know, when this, or when this service ends today, everybody will break into little groups and um, you'll chat with people that you can relate to. Um, and this is good, amen? It's, it can't be a bad thing if you're out there talking to, to, to people. Um, well, it's good if every single person in this auditorium can find somebody to have a conversation with. Um, that uh, if every single person is included in, in, in what is happening after the church service ends. Uh, but, you know, you just might be a visitor or, or new to the church and you might not know many people. And sometimes you can feel a little bit left out here. Now, let me reiterate that our desire to fellowship with our friends and those we're comfortable with is a strong thing. Uh, but if we only do this, then there's the likelihood that others will be excluded. Amen? Uh, and if this is left unchecked, uh, it often causes a church to get a reputation for being a bit cliquey. You know what I mean? Um, we need relationships. Amen? We're just built. God has, has built us that way that we... And we saw this in the sermon that I, I preached last week. It's not good for people to be alone. Uh, we, there, there is something that God wants to give to us through other people. Um, so this is why, this is my contention, that we need small groups within the church uh, in order to fulfill this need. Um, because, you know, if, if the service, the Sunday service is the only time you get to do, spend any time of, of fellowshipping, then you're setting up yourself for a number of negative attitudes that can, if left unchecked, cause you to wander from God's call on your life. And of course, if you wander from God's call on your life, then uh, you, can, you, you, you won't be able to fulfill your destiny. And you'll, you'll go around like a lot of people, uh, walking through life, getting almost to the end of their natural effective uh, service in their life and still haven't found the path that God's called them to. And you wouldn't want to be like that. Amen? So this is why uh, God, through the church, is the thing that, that people's destiny becomes released through. Okay? It's, uh, you, can, you know God on an individual basis. You can study and all that. You can go off to seminary or you can do all the study you like and you can really know this word inside out. But if that's all you're doing, it's not enough. Uh, in fact... Uh, it's when we connect together with other people and serve and, and, and be served in the process is when something really starts happening in your life. And, you, and then you'll find that the Holy, because you're walking in God's will, the Holy Spirit starts moving through your life and that the prophetic and all these other things start just naturally coming about. Well, you need more than the Sunday service. Let me give you a few reasons why. Because... It's unlikely that you will be able to adequately fulfill it. I've put some of this up here. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of this, they can ask me afterwards and I can give it to them. Uh, it's unlikely that you will be able to adequately fulfill your need for fellowship in the short time after church. Uh, you'll probably come to the conclusion there's something wrong with the church. Amen? Um, because it's not meeting my needs. Another reason... Um, should you have a pressing need or question, it's a bit hit or miss as to whether you will meet somebody who's able to help you. So you'll most likely will go away a little fr frustrated uh, with your need unmet. If you've ever been into a church like that. How many of you visit churches in your way on holiday? Often good. You know, some churches can be remarkably cold. You can walk in, sit down, uh, attempt to talk to people and they just don't want to know. We don't want to be like a church like that, do we? Fourthly, as the ministry of God uh, th through preaching, prophecy, etc. Uh, uh, comes, it often stirs up issues. You know, the Holy Spirit starts working in your heart. And if these go off unresolved and there isn't adequate time to process them, uh, especially if you're one of those people who don't like to impose yourself on others, you're not a pushy type of person, um, if you continue to leave things unanswered or unresolved in your life, it can lead to spiritual stagnation. And of course, when things, get stag when things stagnate, 
I mean, it, it's, it's like the life seems to go out of it. And you start wondering why you ever jumped into this river in the first place. Another reason that uh, we need more than the Sunday service is because of this whole thing of superficiality. It's probably the biggest curse on the Western church. Uh, and this is what is perceived by many people as hypocrisy. Uh, unbelievers in particular perceive the superficiality of the church as just a, a, a hypocrisy. So when unbelievers come to Christians for help and answers and get a superficial response, or at least an inadequate response, uh, they tend to get driven further away. They think, oh, the answers I'm looking for are not here, and they, they go off looking in other ways. God doesn't want his church like this. He doesn't want us superficial. In fact, there's a scripture in Jeremiah, which I hadn't uh, planned to bring to you today. It talks about um, God curses those who heal the brokenness of his people superficially. And he was talking to the priests in that Old, Old Testament there through Jeremiah, and I forget the actual reference about Jeremiah 33 something, but uh, healing the, uh, the brokenness of God's people superficially is uh, something that uh, God doesn't um, agree with. Amen? And uh, that's true, of the more, if it's true in the Old Testament, it's much more true now that, uh, you know, we all come into this thing with a certain amount of brokenness. Nobody comes into this thing 100% intact. Amen? We're born into a, a, a sinful world. And we get beat up in the process. You get, can get beat up even in the womb. In fact, you get, you know, beaten up uh, even before conception, just uh, you know, through uh, family history and curses and all that sort of thing. But that's another subject. So we come into this world and, and uh, you know, we're not always broken to the point of uh, not being able to function, but uh, we come in and God's got to put us together again. Amen? God's got to bring healing. And uh, this is where most of this happens in uh, when we get rightly connected to a group of believers. And uh, I often say that the cell groups are probably the best therapeutic place you can ever be. Just being there, you don't necessarily have to say much or take many notes or sing the songs or pray the prayers. Just being there, you like you're in a, in a therapeutic environment where the Holy Spirit is. Of course, this the Sunday service is like that as well. But uh, there's something more that happens in the smaller group. We'll get into that in a second. Okay, so we need a way of doing church that can overcome these sorts of problems. And the method I am convinced that the Holy Spirit is speaking in this day to the church, the New Testament church, is an organization uh, breaking it down, so to speak, in smaller groups, in, in uh, how, small groups or households. Well, the, uh, as we saw last time, Jesus, he came and gathered together how many guys? Twelve. Twelve disciples which later became apostles, guys he trained specifically, but he had, actually had others around at different times as well. And so Jesus was building community. We saw last week that God exists in community, doesn't he? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, and we saw that, you know, the, the potential for what can happen when people get together in community. How many of you have ever played in a sports team? One? Two? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun playing on a team that's playing well together. What isn't fun is playing on a team that isn't playing well together when you're just a, a team of individuals and glory seekers, etc. Uh, so the basic aim of the home group is to build community, and because community can only really be built in groups of less than about 15 people, I mean, Jesus uh, chose 12. Do you think we might should attempt to be smarter than Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, groups of about 12 to 15 people are about the ideal size for something dynamic to happen in the spirit when they get together. Uh, so um, trying to build community at a congregational level is an exercise in futility. We're talking about building New Testament community. And it doesn't happen at this. this. There is advantage in this, by all means. I'm not saying, oh, we're going to shut down our Sunday meeting. We're not going to do that. But uh, it has a certain purpose. 
and has a certain function. But it's the small group where really, you know, the nitty gritty Christianity gets worked out. And I can flat guarantee you over 30 years of ministry that I've uh, been involved in these sort of things that the people who do well are usually the people that have, uh, are always the people that have allowed themselves to get close with other people. Though, that haven't separated themselves for convenience sake. Uh, for um, all the different reasons. And some of them might sound very good. But even the best reasons that we come up to for avoiding cell group or f uh, home group uh, is probably not ultimately going to really cut much weight when God asks us the question. When Jesus generally talked to people about the things that they were doing, uh, you know, th he had this way of just sort of um, dissolving argument uh, and, and, you know, thoughts that were raised up against uh, his kingdom ways. Jesus had a way of just popping those bubbles. Oops. <laughs> Somebody doesn't like my preaching. So... Um, Last week we looked at about the kingdoms of this world. Remember, we, we traced the line of Cain through the Old Testament, uh, through the book of Genesis 5 there, and the, and the line of Seth. And we saw that in the line of Cain were all these guys striving to gain significance from the things that they did. And of course, what was testified about the line of Seth, uh, the uh, third son of Adam and Eve, for those who weren't with us uh, last time, remember, uh, Adam and Eve had a son, Cain, and uh, he rose up and slew Abel. And uh, so uh, Cain was then cast out, uh, excommunicated, so to speak, as that baby has just been. And uh, uh, Seth, Adam and Eve were given another son, Seth, to carry on the family line. Cain disqualified, Abel dead. And so it was testified of the line of Seth that, uh, that men began to call upon the name of the Lord through, through him. Amen? Well, the others were out there inventing this and, and, you know, making tools and music and all that other stuff and drawing their significance from it. And, and that's the sort of thing, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not that we shouldn't be holding down a job and, and learning skills and all that. But if that's where you are attempting to draw your sense of significance, your purpose in, this, in life from, if it's just that, then you're missing it. You're drinking at a poisoned well. God says that, look, it's through him, Jesus Christ, uh, that we, we, uh, we, we look at God, God looks at us, we reflect his glory. Even as, as like in a mirror. Okay? And so our real sense of significance, if you want, you've got mental health issues, if you've got a concern about, you know, your inner image, healthy self-esteem, well, if you are tempting through trying to find success in this world, or just success in relationships, so to speak, uh, popular, who are the guys who have the highest amount of suicides and, and uh, life crashes? It's usually a lot of these top musicians and film stars and things. Uh, you all know about these sort of things. But if you're trying to find life in that area, it's going to turn bitter on you. It may set, uh, taste sweet at first, but it will turn bitter on you. But drawing our life from Christ uh, and from fulfilling his purpose, uh, purposes for our life lasts through to et for eternity. And it's, a star it, it's the thing that will lift you out of whatever you might be in at this particular time. And so how do we do that? Okay. Um, so there is a, a life that comes from the saints being rightly related to each other. Something that God pours in. And I call that true Christian community. And only in the kingdom of God can it be fully uh, and truly be discovered. Okay, so... Um, this sort of uh, New Testament community is difficult to describe to someone who's never experienced it. The only way we'll understand it is when we actually experience it, and once uh, we have, we'll be never, we can never really be satisfied uh, with the superficiality of institutional church life. 
Amen? So, you know, we have two churches in this world. We have the institutional church and we have the body of Christ, the real church. And, you know, hey, we can all shoot back to that institutional thing very easily. We can do it here. It's an attitude of heart. Well, we just become, become comfortable where we don't get challenged. Amen? One thing that a lot of people don't like getting into cell groups about is because they might get challenged. Somebody may have the temerity to stand up and put their finger at their chest and say, well, hey, dude, look what you just said, or look what you've just done, or I don't believe, uh, agree with what you're doing. So there is something, when people get together, there is a risk. Is that right? You know, sometimes I think a lot of people don't like their family Christmases too much because when they get together, you know, those couple of crazies in your family, uh, you know, get under your skin. Well, I mean, in a Christian community, you know, in, in the home group, when the people, you, people, you get closer to people and uh, we've got to get beyond that superficiality that is so much part of our society. God wants to draw us deeper. Amen? God uh, wants his kingdom to grow, and the natural state of God's kingdom is to grow. And so when things start growing, then uh, organizational uh, matters become a little bit more difficult. We talked about this when I gave a little bit of the history of this church last week. Uh, when things grow, you have to actually change things a bit. If you're a little bitty earthworm about this long, and you're climbing, uh, you know, burrowing around through the ground, you'll find that you can get all the air that you need just by absorbing it through your skin. But if you take that, earth, that earthworm and, and, you know, take it from, say, here to uh, Ian there, uh, as the thing gets bigger, much bigger, you, it can't absorb enough oxygen anymore through its skin. And so it needs some other, uh, other thing to, uh, to, to meet that need. And as churches grow bigger, they need to grow smaller. A lot of people will say, oh, I don't want to be in a church that gets too big. Well, they probably realize there's something about the, the communion, the, the companionship that is had in a smaller church they like. But, you know, when you, when you take that attitude, you're actually setting yourself against God in that because God, I believe, wants things to grow bigger. Amen? So uh, if we look... Uh, so if you look through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you find that the household uh, is the uh, basic building block of God's community. Amen? The household. Uh, God tends to... Although things grow big, he breaks it down into smaller units uh, for a number of reasons. Here is a pastor in the uh, Old Testament that had a problem. He was suddenly going from relative obscurity, he'd actually been uh, a farmer by trade, um, born a prince but wound up in the backside of a desert looking after sheep. And then God turns up on him one day, grabs him by the collar, marches him into Egypt and says... Here's a million people, lead them out. And, and you know the story, I know I've shortened it rather gruesomely here, <laughs> drastically. Uh, but he suddenly got a congregation of a million people. Uh, one million people and two million headaches uh, he, he had. And he'd lead them out. And, and I won't go into all the details of that, but they're actually uh, in a place called Midian at the time. And uh, it was on the next day, this is in uh, Exodus 18, verse 13 to 26. It was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw, it's the father-in-law coming, coming in here, uh, and this father-in-law wasn't even an Israelite. He was a Midianite, um, which were a race of people that weren't really uh, kosher. Uh, when it comes to um, leading Israelites. So when Moses', Moses father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have difficulty, they come to me. And I judge between one and another. And I, know, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. 
so Martha's, Moses' father-in-law said to him, this thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice, and I will give you counsel, and God be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that they may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws, and show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, and every small matter they shall judge, they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you'll be able to endure, and all these people will also be able to go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father in law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And so they judged the people at all times. The hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. What did he do here in verse 25? He said, Moses chose able men out of all of the nation, made them heads, uh, rulers over thousands of hundreds of fifties and rulers of tens. So what was the smallest unit that uh, Moses set people over? Ten. Groups of ten. And why did he do it? Well, there was something, the people were getting worn out, having to wait for Moses uh, you know, one person who's probably, I mean, he had a million people to look after. Who's ever been in a, had to spend some time in Centrelink? <laughs> Do I need to push this analogy any further? Uh, I probably don't, do I? You can go in there and you can wait and one person's dealing with millions, probably more people than Moses. Uh, and it can be really frustrating. Amen. And so, uh, breaking it down and giving, devolving authority. And of course, the Holy Spirit's in the middle of it, working, uh, guiding the leaders. Uh, and then, of course, w w they were all referring upwards uh, what they couldn't handle. So, the old ruler of ten and, you know, sort of downtown Midian, uh, he wasn't going to try and stop a plague that might have been going through the people. That was Moses' job. But he had, he had responsibility for a, probably a couple of households. In fact, probably in those days, the households were a lot bigger. The ruler of ten was probably just one, one family. Okay, so this is the method that God has used to, or has given us through the scriptures, and we see this quite a bit uh, through the scriptures, as we're going to get into in just a second, uh, as uh, a starting block for society. We've often said the family is the basing, you know, families are the building blocks of our society. That's why there's so much attack against the family in this nation at the moment. <coughs> so, the smallest unit, uh, which was often the household of an individual family. And when we go into the New Testament, and of course the New Testament was written in Greek, and so our Bible today is a translation from this original Greek language. And uh, sometimes when you translate between languages, sometimes you don't always quite get the fullness of the meaning. Uh, sometimes you can miss it quite drastically in a translation. But the word uh, in the original Greek was this word oikos, which actually means household. And there's a lot of words that are derived from this uh, word oikos, which we probably won't go into today. And this word occurs all throughout the New Testament. Um, and it refers to the personal community that exists for each one of us. We're all part of a household, but we're not just part of, you know, a natural genetic household, mum, dad and the kids sort of thing. Uh, but there is actually, uh, the household actually means a little bit more than that. Uh, Sociologists have often call this, this thing our, uh, have another name for this phenomena called a psychosocial group. 
Uh, in Acts 16, verse 31, how many of you ever held this scripture up to the Lord and asked him to you know, fulfill this in your family? Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. How many have used that to pray for their family members? Good, do it. Uh, but actually, uh, God intends a little bit more than just your family members when you're talking about household. Okay, remember this funny word called oikos. Okay, uh, this oikos, or household that each of us lives in, is not that large. Uh, we may know several dozen people, even hundreds, but we actually devote quality time to a very few of them. And so it's only really that the, the, uh, to those whom we devote quality time, can we say is part of our household, part of our oikos, our personal community. Each of us has a primary group, which includes some of our family and friends and neighbours. Uh, these are the people we talk to and relate to and share with at least for about an hour a week, at least an hour a week, people that we are regularly meeting in contact with. Uh, it's really unusual to find a person that has more than 20 people in their psychosocial group, their oikos. Uh, surveys have shown that most Christians have about nine, and a large percentage of Christians haven't developed a new single oikos member in the past six months. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a picture up here. This, this gives us a little bit of a... Um, a pictorial example of a person's oikos. Okay, so there's your typical bloke over there, or person over there who's fairly well rounded, and he has probably about 20 people that he would relate to, he or she would relate to on a weekly basis. Uh, maybe you're a little bit older and you don't get around as much, or maybe you don't get around as much for other reasons, and yours can be a bit limited. And then, of course, you get the wounded people of this life, who uh, find that relationships are really a challenge and difficult, and so they may have very few uh, in them. So life is made up of these endless chains of oikos connections. Uh, each one of you is already entwined in these relationships. So even as I'm speaking about it, you, you, you're thinking about who the people that you are naturally connected with. So these oikoses, these households, provide. They do something for you. It's not that you're just there and you've got to be loyal and you've got to trudge along to the oikos meeting, you know, or the dinner table or whatever. I mean, you know, you understand? There's something in your household that happens for you. It provides acceptance. We all need acceptance. Amen? Uh, and it provides security. Amen? Nobody more insecure than these guys, the wounded group down here. Amen? In fact, the more you are towards this level, the more secure, the more accepted, the more life is going better for you. But as you start heading in this direction, then uh, look out. You know, you, you, you're heading, heading for trouble. So the security, um, just about every culture has this sort of thing going on, almost without exception. And the security we find from the affirmation that we receive from those we consider significant within our oikos is, is, is what keeps us going in life. We all need security. Amen? A lot of people try to find security in other things and money and all that, but you know sometimes they find that their psychosocial group here, their households, diminish. And you can see in some of these, even Australian billionaires, you know, uh, people sort of coming in and, and leaving. And each time they leave, they leave with big settlements, etc. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I don't get sued. I won't go into more detail than that. So uh, each oikos, each household becomes part of a larger social group, eventually forming a local community, or in our context, the church. Uh, just, just for a moment, think about who forms your oikos, your household, your inner circle, your expanded household. Who are the people that you regularly spend one hour with or more? Where do you think you, where would you locate yourself on that diagram behind me there? 
You're a little bit on that, the small size. Well, maybe you need to expand your oikos by joining a home group, being part of a home group. Yes, you may not uh, think that you necessarily will like those people that are in your home group initially, but you know, it's, it's amazing. Over the course of time, uh, you draw close to people that you would never ordinarily draw, and your life is enriched and you grow because of it. If you only hang out with people who are just like you, who are just, you know, comfortable uh, or, or fit within your, what you, your perceived comfort zone, then you're not going to grow. You, you're going to remain uh, static or, you, you, you know, you, you're going to grow in a stunted fashion. I mean, we all grow. You know, growth is inevitable, but there's good growth and, and not so good growth. Amen? Go and look at your gardens after this rain and this warm weather. Uh, you'll see some, th some things have grown well and others, well, you don't want them in the garden, do you? Okay, so uh, there's a real wisdom in a strategy of connecting with other people's oikoses or their households, especially when we bring the gospel. You know, we, we tend to be individualistic and we think, oh, we just go to one person. No, well, you know, there's actually, uh, if, if life is a group of all these interconnecting uh, circles, then it should be easy to start something just percolating through. And so Jesus said that, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your whole household shall be saved. It's that uh, scripture in Acts that we just read a few minutes ago. There's something about this. That there's the, the, the power of the gospel and God's will is that the, the Holy Spirit in you would touch other people and then percolate through that, that group that they're attached with. To. And that the kingdom of God should impact society through this, the, these household groups. And so, how do we know this is happening? Well, what did we see Jesus doing when he was on his ministry? Sure, he taught in the temple, but you know, every time he taught in the temple, uh, he just about lost his life. But what did he do? He went from temple to uh, house to house. He taught on hills and things like that, but even then he had to get out of there quick at times. One time he taught in a larger group and they all turned up and they were about to throw him over a cliff. So it was a little bit risky for Jesus to teach and preach in, in, the larger, uh, in larger groups. But we see him going from house to house, bringing the gospel. Luke 19, 2 to 5, he's inviting himself to Zacchaeus' house. In Luke 7, 36 to 38, he's in a Pharisee's house after having been invited to dinner. Uh, Matthew 8, 14, he enters Peter's house and heals one of the members of Peter's household. Actually raises uh, Pete's mum up and, and, and she you know, then cooks them all a meal. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 10, uh, we see a meeting dinner with his disciples and many tax gatherers. And so there's a heap of scriptures. I mean, all through the Gospels, you'll see Jesus going into households, ministering and teaching, and his impact, the impact of Jesus uh, went through the whole household. Yeah, sure, there was always individual members who, who balked uh, and, 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 didn't, uh, you know, and didn't go with it, even rebelled against it. Uh, Jesus did say that the member, uh, your, your enemies will be members of your own household. The word he was talking about was their oikos, the gospel will come in and, uh, you know, affects you and then flows out through you. And it will bring a division like a sword in your own family. And it does divide sometimes. How many have been in that situation? You've got members of your household that, you know, uh, put the, the heels down and they're not, um, you know, not willing to move, even to the point where they turn against you. Sometimes those people will actually turn against you to the point where, you can be slung out of a whole household. We see that happening through all the Muslim countries and now. But even here, back in the day when there was a Catholic-Protestant divide in this household, if you jumped the fence and tried to marry somebody on the other side of that thing, and it wasn't that long ago in this nation that, that this sort of thing was happening. If you were Protestant and, or Catholic and wanted to marry a, somebody from the other side, you, you could get cut off. Uh, so... In Acts 50, uh, 5 verse 42, we see the early church going from house to house. In Acts 8 verse 3, uh, when Paul 
was hell-bent on destroying this new church. What was Paul's strategy? You know, he was going from house to house. Because where was the church hanging out? House to house. But it wasn't talking about nuclear family to nuclear family to nuclear family, like, you know, our culture has become. And of course now those families, I mean, you know, you can just see Satan's strategy from the community that we used to enjoy, present in African communities and that, much more than us. Gradually we came down to the, you know, post-war this, we came down to the nuclear uh, family, mum and dad shot off to nursing homes. Uh, you know, now we've got a situation where kids are pushed away each day. Look, I, I don't want to tread on toes here, but I, I am saying there's a spirit behind all of this. Uh, you know, and they're pushed off to school, or worse thing, boarding schools. Talk about, well, anyway, I'm going to be into opinion here, so I better get a better, you know. And so man becomes an island, so to speak. And, and it, it, you can see it, society's pressure is to isolate us and to get us into smaller and smaller groups. But the kingdom's purpose is different. It wants to push us the other way. Yes. Amen? Amen? And becoming, extending our family groups, opening up our hearts, even if our hearts are wounded. Because healing comes as we open. Amen? You ever tried to get a thorn out of a two-year-old's foot? <laughs> They're not going to let you out, are they? Uh, well, we can be a bit like that with our heart at times. Okay, so what else is happening in Acts? So Paul's finding people in the houses, and he is uh, that's where he goes, to find them, to drag them out and put them in prison. Acts 10, the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is a very significant uh, pivotal point in, in, in uh, the biblical narrative here, is that the Holy Spirit arranges for Peter to go into the house of a Gentile centurion called Cornelius. And God's spirit turns up and bang, that whole household, must be 50 of them odd, into the kingdom. Bang, like that. And that starts a major revival that wakes Peter up to the fact that, hey, uh, sorry, you know, God's saying, well, Pete, your oikos is not just to include Jews. Amen? Peter and a lot of the other apostles of that time thought, well, no, you know, the Gentiles non-Jewish people are too unclean, unworthy of receiving salvation. So they kept it to themselves. And then God, by a sovereign act, uh, broke them out of that. Because if they hadn't have broken them out of that, then they would have been uh, disqualified from continuing on. And God does and will find another person to do the work that he's called you to. I sense that's prophetic. Anyway, I certainly believe that. The penetration of oikoses was the pattern for ministry in the first century. Uh, conversions were frequently recorded in the scriptures in the book of Acts here as sweeping a whole household into the kingdom. Amen? But somebody started it. Like somebody received Christ. Somebody allowed the Holy Spirit to come through into them and gave the Holy Spirit access to the members of his household. Are you that person? In Acts 16, Lydia and the Philippian jailer were converted along with all the members of their households. Uh, the first act of Lydia after her conversion was to invite Paul to stay at her house. And so Paul probably gathered the believers together in that house, and that's where the church started. This church started really from a small meeting that started in a house. That, you know, after you get to more than about 12, 15 people, you're looking for a slightly bigger venue, depending on the size of your house. When you get to up to 30, 40, 50 people, well, you need a little hall. And when you move beyond that, well, you need bigger uh, facilities. Uh, anyway, so except that as things get bigger, what do we do? We break them down. So if it's out in a thousand, well, how many tens are you, uh, groups of ten are you going to have in a thousand? Maths lesson, hundred, okay. So you see what I mean. We were in a church, and uh, after we'd left the mission field in, in Ireland in '94, we joined a church in uh, Melbourne uh, called City Life. It was called Waverley Christian Fellowship at that time, 
and it was about 800 people, 800 to 1,000 people turned up on Sunday morning for church, uh, which is a pretty big church. It was the big, one of the biggest churches in, uh, in Melbourne, at, even at that time. But then Mark Connor took it over from his father, and he really, uh, uh, um, he really stressed the whole thing about uh, selves, and he changed the way they did him, and uh, the expectations and what cell groups were all about, and that church started growing. And we were with it for about another three or four years after that. That stage, it had hit something like about four and a half thousand people, and it grew out to about eight or nine where it is today. Big church broken down to cell groups. I once had the play, uh, the, uh, the ability of uh, or the opportunity of talking to Joel LaBelle, who's the uh, well one of the senior pastors in Hillsong, well, how do you, how do you, you know, you've got all these people coming, how do you take care of them? And, uh, you know, because a lot of people, just visitors, and he said it's an interesting thing, you know, people often sit in about, in the same area in the church. Of course, we don't do that, do we? You look around, you know, <laughs> you've never sat beside, beside that, it's all right, husband and wives are okay, you know. Uh, but, you know, people sit in the same area, and so they've, and Hillsong have noted in that great, who's ever been to that Hillsong church? It's a massive thing, seats about 20,000 people. Um, but people sit in the same areas, believe it or not. And so what they've done is they've got these area pastors. So this area pastor sort of gets up and he looks and he starts recognising the people and he says, oh yeah, okay, okay. And then uh, you know, his name turns up in the bulletin or something and, and those people start drifting towards him. He's often introduced or he'll get up afterwards and just you know, introduce himself to the people. And from that point, they start organising into the smaller groups. And that's how a church of 20,000 people can, can uh, grow. Amen. And that Hillsong is probably a, a phenomena in this world even. But certainly here in Australia. Okay. Um, let me bring this in for a landing. Uh, so, I mean, this word oikos is used so much in the, uh, in the New Testament uh, in referring to the early church. Uh, look, I'm going to just put a bunch up there. Here we go. Got those? Okay. Uh, Acts 18, verse 18. Um, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord uh, with all his household. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptised. Okay, that's how the church came to Corinth. In Rome, Apelles, approved in Christ, uh, when Paul writes at the back in Romans 16, he uh, uh, writes to the leaders of the heads of a number of households. Okay? Uh, in um, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, well, okay, that's a slightly different use of it, but they are all, uh, all describe the household, the oikos that was there. Um, if anyone, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, if anyone doesn't provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay, there's a little bit of a uh, something for those who do lead households. On a natural state, we're talking about the father, uh, but it, you know, in, in a, a kingdom thing, it could be, could be anybody. 2 Timothy 1.16 uh, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. What's the correct? Onesiphorus. Okay. Don't know why God chose the Greeks to bring the New Testament to, but uh, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Um, and here's going one uh, referring back to the days of Noah by faith. Noah, being divinely warned by things not, you see, not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Okay, so even Noah, uh, realising that he was the head of a household, uh, realising certain things were coming on, was willing to build an ark with all that talk, uh, through which his household were preserved. Now, I think if we look through the, this thing, and, and if, especially taking this thing in Hebrews 11, there is safety and security in the small group. I mean, we're in a warfare, folks. Amen? 
uh, you know, if, if you haven't woken up to the fact that the, there's a war going on, uh, a spiritual war going on, then uh, you go, you're going to probably become a casualty of it. There is a war. We have to uh, negotiate our way through that war. And yet we know we win. But there is a... Uh, God's provided a way, a pathway, for us to take to get through that. Amen? And so uh, we believe that that connecting together with other believers in a small group doesn't mean that you're in that group for the rest of your life, but there are seasons. I mean, the youth group functions as a, a small group right now. Uh, you know, and other groups have emerged within the churches of... Um, baby down there trying to upstage me again. Uh, so within the church here, there are groups that, that meet. And yes, it's sometimes advantageous to have people in that are, you know, reasonably similar for a season. But, you know, as I said earlier, we grow much more when we, are, we connect with other people that are not like us as well. Our modern church, as we see it in Australia today, differs significantly from the one we see in the book of Acts. Um, next time I, I get to share with you, we'll look at some of these differences, uh, along with some of the satanic strategies against the church. If we use New Testament strategies, we will get New Testament results. Amen? Uh, and ministry based on households uh, of believers... Oikos is, is, I am convinced, God's plan for raising up the bride that Jesus is coming back for. Uh, Jesus is looking for real, compassionate, committed people. He is looking for a wise bride. Okay? One of the things that's going to uh, be noted of the church is it's going to be wise. The bride of Christ will we'll, we'll have a wisdom about it that... Uh, the world will find attractive. Doesn't at this point so much. But God wants a wise bride. How many of you, when you marry, want your marriage partner to be an absolute brainless airhead? Okay, hands going, no, okay. You want somebody with a bit of wisdom, don't you? Uh, not some airhead filled with silly ideas, put there by their own selfishness, promoted even by the enemy of mankind, the devil himself. So we can see that the kingdom's uh, ways are different from the world's ways. And, you know, Christianity is really is disentangling ourselves from the world's ways. Doesn't mean that God doesn't want you prosperous or skillful in some area, but if that's all that your life is, then uh, you're, you're headed for destruction. There is a point where you can actually slip so far away from God that you can lose your salvation. Okay. I know that might sound a bit uncomfortable, but you can lose your salvation. And how do you do it? Well, stop believing. How do you get salvation in the first place? You believe. Amen? But there has come a point where you can actually, the devil can separate you from the life of God to, to the point where you even doubt his existence. And many a Christian is backslidden in that state. Some of you went back to that after first being revived. But then by the grace of God, we're able to come back. Amen? Your heart got stirred. That little seed of faith that you still had got flamed and uh, faith broke out again like fire in your heart and uh, lit the way for, you know, your way back into the kingdom. Amen? So there is a warfare out there. The devil wants to sow unbelief and doubt, fear, Selfish, selfishness, greed, uh, all these things in your heart so that uh, he can split you off from God's purposes. And, you know, one of the things that, one of the safeguards that God's given us, ultimately it's going to come down to you, but one of the safeguards God gives us is each other. Amen? Amen? But not just the whole body of Christ in some nebulous thing, but committed people. People who will, uh, will, will draw close to you and uh, commit themselves to you uh, f for seasons. Everything in this Christian life runs in seasons. Amen? We're all in seasons. Seasons change. Praise God. Who's glad the hot weather's gone? Well, for the moment anyway. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we, we thank you for your, uh, your grace to us. Uh, Father, I hope that today we've got a, a greater appreciation of your kingdom and our part in it and how it functions and how you, Jesus, set it up and how your early disciples got, uh, had to learn Father, that this is the way the kingdom is built. These are the people that the kingdom is built with. Uh, Father, it's fairly clear, uh, Father, the, these first steps we need to take. And uh, Lord, we know that it's in the household, in that uh, the basic Christian family setting that we grow and we're nurtured and we find security and we find purpose. And we learn to exercise our gifts and... Uh, we can use others as a sounding board for the revelation that we believe we're getting from God. Lord, it's a place, Father, we can not only receive, but we can also contribute. Because you did say it's better to give than to receive, but receiving's necessary too, Lord God. And so, Father, we thank you that uh, you've opened up our hearts and minds to these things today. Lord, I just pray if there's anybody here today that uh, hasn't joined themselves to Christ in the first place, well, you can do that today. And all it takes is say something in your heart like, God, I've, I've wandered from you, I'm, I've been doing my own thing. I haven't connected myself to, to your plans, your purposes. I've been following this world. But... Uh, Right now in my seat, I'm making a, a decision that I'm going to change. And I'm going to turn around and walk and go your way. And seek your will and purpose for my life. I know I have acceptance uh, with you through Jesus. I know that my sin that once separated from me is, is cleansed and taken away through what Jesus did. So if that's you today, just that's all you have to do. Just say, Father, I believe. I want to go your way. And if that's you today, come and talk to one of us uh, after that. Let us know about that because we, we need to be able to help you in that, in the initial steps of that walk. For the believers here today, well, I don't know where you put yourself on that continuum. Father, we're called to judge ourselves that we be not judged. And that, uh, Father, when we become aware of your will and purpose uh, to, to delay or to say no to it, uh, puts us as an opposition to, our, to you. So, Father, we pray, I pray for these people today, that we're all, Father, in our individual walk, we're all, uh, Father, uh, somewhere on, on, on that, uh, that road to fulfilling our destiny. To that place where we can finally come and say, well, we've, we've arrived. Uh, we have fulfilled the role that you've given us. That for us, one day, is, or that there is laid up for us that treasure in heaven. And that accolade that we receive from the Father, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Lord, that's the desire we all have, but uh, Father, many may come short of that from not perceiving your kingdom. Not perceiving the church and their, where, where you've placed them within it. So Lord, in all of these things, we, we, we just trust your Holy Spirit to continue to lead and guide us. We can't walk this path alone. It's a spiritual path, often invisible to the natural eye. Father, sometimes you only give us a glimpse of a, a short time down the road we unlike you cannot see the end from the beginning and it hasn't been given to us to do that because we'd muck it up for sure so Lord we, we, we give you praise we do, we do acknowledge that uh, Father you, are, you love us you've got a wonderful plan for our lives that uh, Father um, all we need to do is draw close to you and Father you will lead us by your spirit all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.